Hello, my name's Lindsay Turnbull and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at the University of Oxford. And we're right in the middle of this very serious coronavirus crisis right now. And my students are all stuck at home and we want to keep them in touch with biology and keep them in touch with us. And so we're going to make a new series of videos and they're going to be called Back Garden Biology. and welcome to this episode of Back Garden Biology, when in fact I'm in the front garden. Next to me is a plant that I'm sure is familiar to all of you, and if you're a gardener at the moment, you may have some of these in your garden, they are roses. And of course, English gardens are really famous for their roses, and this one's doing very well. It was planted by the person who owned the house before me, and roses get better and better as they get older, they get more vigorous, they get a good root system down, and now it produces lots of these wonderful flowers you can see that it's not a wild rose because it just has so many petals in each flower. So roses belong to the family it's named after them, the Rosaceae, and they're characterised by having simple flowers with exactly five petals. And this one clearly has got a lot more, and that's the efforts of the breeder. And the breeder in this case is called David Austin. He's very famous for breeding English roses, and the variety is called Gertrude Jekyll, and it's a very famous, a very popular rose in England, and it smells really wonderful. So that's one of the good things about David Austin's roses and some of the other breeders, they've kept the scent of roses, which is so important. The smell of sterility, well, who wants to smell that? Okay, today's question is, why is the world green? Now the leaves of the rose are green and so are the leaves of just about every other plant in the world. And that's the first part to that question. Why are the leaves of plants green and not some other colour? The second part to that question though is different. It's an ecological question. Why do the world's plants still have all their leaves? Why have they not been stripped to the bone by the collective actions of the world's herbivores? Now the productivity of plants is, is normally called primary productivity. It's not secondary productivity which comes from herbivores eating plants. And in the oceans there's also significant primary productivity, not by plants but by all different kinds of algae. And in the oceans a lot of that primary productivity does end up in the mouths of herbivores. But on land we know that although we can often find plants with a small amount of damage, it's pretty rare to see, well, I've certainly never seen an entire tree stripped to the bone. So why is that? Why does most of the primary productivity on land stay in the plants? Well, ecologists don't have full answers to that question, I can tell you. But we have, but I've been doing some investigations in my own front garden, and I think I can start to shed a little bit of light on why that might be. So we've had to come inside to try to address the first part of that, why is the world green question. The first part is the physiological part. Why are leaves green? And we've got a prism set up, which is refracting sunlight onto this whiteboard, and I hope you can see it and it makes this beautiful rainbow. And that's because the light from the sun is actually, the, in the visible spectrum, is actually a mixture of colours. So you see the classic rainbow, Roy G. Biv, the, um, sorry, Roy G. Biv going this way, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And the red are the longer wavelengths, the blue are the shorter wavelengths, and as the light passes through the glass, it is slowed down. But, the, but some wavelengths, the blue wavelengths, are slowed down more. And so they get more, um, more bent, more refracted. And by going through two surfaces of a prism, they separate away from the red. So I've got somebody holding it up at the window and managing to get it at just the right angle to throw it onto here. Now, we know now then that visible light consists of these different colours. So what does that mean to do with leaves being green? Well, inside the leaves, there are, um, there's a molecule called chlorophyll and it absorbs radiation from the sun and it can only absorb certain wavelengths. So it absorbs the blue light very well and it absorbs the red light very well. And so what it doesn't absorb is the wavelength in the middle. So what you're left with there is the green light. It keeps moving a bit, but it's about there. It's only quite a narrow band that looks green. 
and the leaves reflect that green light. So they absorb the blue light, they absorb the red light, and they reflect the green light. Now, what's going on there? Well, when they absorb light, either the blue or the red, they use the energy inside it to excite electrons. And electrons are the small negative particles that orbit atoms. And by firing electrons out of the chlorophyll molecule, they are able to split water. So water is two hydrogens bound to an oxygen very tightly. And for the plant to make carbohydrates from carbon dioxide, the plant needs a source of hydrogen. So carbon di carbohydrates contain carbon, oxygen and hydrogen. The plant can get the carbon and the oxygen from carbon dioxide, from CO2, but it needs hydrogen as well. And the only place on Earth you can get a lot of hydrogen from is water. But getting the hydrogen out of water is really, really difficult. And that's what the photosystem of the chlorophyll does. So it absorbs light energy, fires an electron out of the chlorophyll molecule, and the chlorophyll molecule is now so desperate to get an electron back that it will smash up a molecule of water to grab an electron out of it. And that frees the hydrogen, which the plant then captures and shuttles away to make carbohydrates. So it's sort of amazing, really, but the leaves have this incredible system going on where they're absorbing the sun's energy to split water and they're going to use the hydrogen in there to make carbohydrates. Why can't they use the green wavelengths? Nobody knows. We do not understand that, why it is that chlorophyll absorbs very well in the red wavelengths and the blue wavelengths but not in the green. But it really makes me think if you went to an alien planet how likely is it that the chlorophyll that had, had evolved there would also not be able to use the green light? I think it's really, really unlikely. So it's quite likely that photosynthesis has evolved on another planet, but I bet you any money that all the plants wouldn't be green. So when the plants have split the water molecules and shuttled the hydrogen away to attach that to CO2 to make carbohydrates, glucose, then the oxygen in the water molecule is free and it's just put into the atmosphere. And of course, that's one of the amazing roles that the primary producers play. They generate all the oxygen that's in the atmosphere. And that's the combined activities of all the plants on land and all the various kinds of algae in the oceans. Now, what about the second part of our question, why is the world green? We were asking, why do all the plants have so many leaves? Why haven't they just been gobbled up by the world's herbivores? Well, it's partly because a mature leaf like this one from this ivy here, is not a very exciting meal. It's very tough, it's fibrous, it's packed full of a molecule called cellulose, which is what plants use to make their cell walls. And actually animals don't have the enzymes to digest cellulose. There are specialist herbivores, uh, cows and various and large mammals called ruminants, uh, which can digest cellulose, but they can't do it themselves. They have to have these ridiculously enormous elaborate stomachs that are full of bacteria that actually digest the cellulose for them. But there are other ways to eat plants that don't just involve chomping on the leaves. And on the 26th of April, I went out into my front garden, which as you see is full of roses, and saw a kind of gardener's nightmare, which was that the tips of the roses, the new shoots which are producing the flowers, look like this, absolutely covered in aphids. Now, why are the aphids all collected there? Well, it's because the mature leaves are the, are the sugar factories. They're making all the sugar, but they're exporting a lot of it to the growing parts of the plant, which needs that sugar to build new leaves and new flowers. So that's where the aphids aggregate and they just stick their stylets into the pipes of the plant, the sugar carrying pipes, and the plant just pumps sugar into them. The fantastic trick for them. Of course, there are lots of things that want to eat those aphids and they're coming after them. And what I notice is just a few days later, those aphids have practically disappeared. Now, what could have accomplished that in such a short space of time? Now, your attention might naturally turn to ladybirds. They're very famous predators of aphids. It could be this seven spot ladybird. I do see those around in the front garden. This was one on the rosemary very early in the year. They hibernate as adults over the winter. Or it could be one of these amazing parasitoid wasps. Lots of those attack aphids, like this little braconid wasp here. They lay their eggs inside the aphids, and you can see the aphids here kicking their 
butts around to try and deflect them. Uh, and they turn the aphids into so-called mummies. So they lay their eggs inside them. The, the aphid becomes sort of paralysed and then the larvae just eat it from the inside out. And when they finish their development, they bust out in a kind of alien style manner. The problem with those kinds of predators like ladybirds and parasitoid wasps is early in the year, they're really behind the curve. So you imagine that the leaves come out on the plants in the early spring, the aphids arrive first and they start building their populations. And then the ladybirds and the wasps have to arrive and it takes them time to build up their populations because they have to eat some aphids first and then turn those aphids into new wasps or new ladybirds. And so they tend to be behind the curve. So it takes them quite a bit longer. By later in the summer, you'll see aphid populations crashing on a much wider scale and lots of ladybirds looking around for something to eat. But they can't have done that in my front garden in the space of a few days. So what could it have been? It couldn't be. No. Surely not? Not this mild-mannered house sparrow. Dawn on a Sunday morning and you can see this colony of sparrows flying in and out of the eaves of the house opposite. There's quite a large group of them up there, 20 to 25 perhaps, and I have to admire the tolerance of, their, of the occupant of the house, the human occupant of the house, who's obviously happy to put up with them because sparrows, well, they don't really contribute to the dawn chorus. They just sort of engage in a bit of a dawn shouting match with each other. Anyway, this was hardly the smoking gun. Just because I can see they're nesting opposite doesn't mean they're doing anything to my roses. I hung out the bedroom window, I staked out the front garden by lurking behind the dustbins, but most of the footage I obtained just looked like this. Now this might come as a bit of a surprise to cafe owners up and down Britain who can barely keep the sparrows off the scones of their customers, but these sparrows are not that tame and there's a sparrow hawk lurking around our neighbourhood too, so they're not very keen to be caught out in the open. In desperation, I actually set up a trail cam in the bay window looking out over the front garden and I managed to film this and, and then this and then this and then this. But obviously it wasn't really the footage I was after. Anyway, eventually, one morning, very early, you can see the angle of the sun's rays here, I did manage to film a small group of sparrows flying into one of my rose bushes, messing about a bit and then flying away again. But then finally, one male sparrow took pity on me and I just gave up and filmed him through the window and I managed to get this footage of him really gleaning away and you can see just how effective those sparrows are at removing aphids in a very delicate way from every part of your roses. Let's end this episode where we began, sitting next to Gertrude Jekyll, that beautiful rose. I can smell it from here, it's wonderful. Gertrude Jekyll was a very famous gardener, by the way, and that's why she had this rose named after her. So what we learned this week was the world is green, partly because of the nature of chlorophyll, that it is unable to use green light and it reflects that green light back and only absorbs the red and the blue light. That's one reason why the world is green. The other reason is that the world's herbivores are not really able to remove a large percentage of the leaves that plants produce, partly because they're really rather indigestible and partly because there are lots of predators who are on them. And we learned that the generalist predator like the sparrow is actually really effective in biological control because its population is not closely tied to the prey, unlike the ladybirds who have to track the prey through time. They can be very effective, but they're tending to boom and bust as the prey populations go up and down. So don't forget to feed those sparrows through the winter because they'll really pay you back come spring.